Hello and welcome to the big picture. The, Occu the Occupy Central protests in Hong Kong has entered its fourth week since students and professors of the university walked out of their classes. The protests are seen as the most substantive, substantive challenge to the Chinese leadership and its one country, two systems model. With China continuing to show no signs of capitulating to the demands of the protesters to get the chief executive to resign, apart from greater democracy, the protesters, however, are equally adamant. The August 31 decision of the Chinese government to pre-screen candidates who will contest the elections to the chief executive in 2017 had sparked off the protests. These protests are now finding support in other countries too, like Australia. However, the Chinese government hopes that it would fade off. We will discuss today what have been the real causes behind this unprecedented unrest in Hong Kong and where these protests are heading and what are the options before the Chinese government. To discuss this, I have with me Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti, former ambassador, Nihal Singh, senior journalist and former editor, Professor Baladas Goshal, senior fellow, Center for Policy Research, and Professor Kashiram Sharma, retired professor of Chinese studies at the Delhi University. Welcome to all of you. Mr. Chakravarti, I would like to come to you first. Do you think that this, these protests uh, which we are witnessing was just, uh, you know, was sparked off by that August 31 announcement? Or you think that this has been festering for quite some time? I think the, one of the, some of the things that one should note about these protests is that, that, uh, that there is a new generation. I think that the, 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 the age group that is on, out on the streets, I think the leader is just 17 year old. Yeah. And there are various others, although the professors have been encouraging them to some extent. Now, I think it's also because the 2017, whoever, you know, the election that is supposed to be the chief executive uh, uh, of Hong Kong, uh, I think there was, there was this understanding or feeling, uh, I'm not sure which, but that, that it will be, be a free election. Right. And anybody could stand. That seems to have uh, not, uh, not, uh, not, it's, it's, it's not being done because they are going to pre-screen and only a panel will be there for, for which people have to vote. I think this has somehow triggered off this kind of uh, protest because people genuinely in Hong Kong, I think, want, want, want a proper democracy. And they are unwilling uh, to, to be dictated by the mainland sort of government and so I think this is part of that, uh, you know, upsurge that is happening in, in Hong Kong. And why China is unwilling to concede anything is because of the repercussions that this would have in other parts of China. Because that is, that is their fear. Okay. Uh, Professor Goshal, why is China not uh, willing to do it? You, you think that, you know, they, they promised this full universal free suffrage, universal suffrage and you know free elections and demo, free, full democracy and things like that but still going back on these on their words at this point of time why do you think it happened i think the chinese government are not prepared to concede to their original assurance that there will be one country but two systems right i think they want to make it much more uniform political system not only in Hong Kong, but they have also given a notice to Taiwan as well right. that they might integrate Taiwan within China. Now, I think this demand for democracy or universal, greater universal suffrage has to do also with some of the socio-economic factors in Hong Kong. There is a popular belief that Hong Kong is a very prosperous place. Right. But according to one report, which was published by Hong Kong government itself in 2013, there are 1.3 million people who are below the poverty line. Okay. Now, these people are increasingly feeling disenfranchised in a, many respects, and their opportunities for employment and other things are shrinking because of the fact that China has taken over as the main manufacturing, sector, manufacturing country. And Hong Kong became more like a retail place. But the problem with recent developments are that China is undertaking this move against corruption. The result is affecting Hong Kong itself. You know, the sales of expensive watches and jewelries have gone down okay. as a result of all this. Now, all these are affecting the ordinary population in Hong Kong. And I think more than this 
sort of, you know, a student's sort of outburst against uh, greater freedom and all that, I think the socioeconomic factors are also playing a very important role in providing support to the protesters. Professor Sharma, would you agree with that? And do you think that this is, this is an isolated thing which is happening in Hong Kong and, uh, you know, that Chinese, the Chinese government can expect to, you know, put it down or it, as it expects that, you know, it will just fade off over a period of time? Uh, I will offer two comments. No, it's not an isolated incident. It's not an episode. I, I see a pattern in this protest. I think a moment is in the making. And people of Hong Kong are relatively used to more freedom, you know. Don't forget it was a showpiece of the British administration. Right. Therefore, my comment number one is that the people of Hong Kong are very jealous to protect their democratic rights. Symbolically, it's a question of how to elect the chief executive. That's an occasion. It's, it's just a symbolic but, thing. But, but, but the question Demanding, is, Demand of, of his resignation is just a symbolic thing. That, that, that's true. But, but the, the problem is much deeper. In fact, Hong Kong offers you one of the soft belly of China. Why do you think China is invincible? China is not invincible. China has a soft belly. And uh, the demand for freedom or the demand for democracy is a universal demand. Even within China, in certain provinces, there have been a student protest in support of the Hong Kong people. But secondly, it's not coming out. We secondly, don't know. We don't get to hear about it too much. Yes. Secondly, what, what about the Chinese promise of one country, two system? You know, Tang Xiaoping, the paramount leader, the modernizer of China, a man who is respected immensely in China. If you ask me honestly, Chinese respect him much more than they respect Mao Zedong. He made a promise to the Chinese people that one country, two system. And, and the people in Hong Kong feel that, you know, the Chinese government is violating that kind of a promise. My, my second comment is more important. Well, I see a movement in China where, where I, I'm not saying China will go the Soviet way, no. As a social scientist, I'll use my words more cautiously. But again, I will not say that China will not go the Soviet way. Why not? Chinese have fixed up only one fault line, that is economic fault line. Chinese economy is no more a state economy and market is playing a role. What about the other fault lines? What about the democracy deficit? Therefore, I have a feeling, I may be wrong, but I have a feeling that... That this will have a, larger implications. Some kind of a larger... Larger implications. Mr. There. Nihal Singh, do you see a larger implications to this? Or is it, is it something which is confined to this, to Hong Kong and, you know, it may, it, over a period of time, that's Chinese, or Chinese hope, the Chinese leadership hopes that, you know, they'll be able to put it down. No, I think there's a whole set of circumstances that uh, is responsible for what has happened, which is unprecedented, really. I think it's the biggest test for the Chinese leadership since the Tian An Man Square You massacre. think so? I think, I think so. In okay. The circumstances are one that uh, what the people of Hong Kong feel betrayed because what was given by one hand in terms of universal suffrage has been taken away by the other saying it, they, the candidates would be only two, three, and they'd be screened by a pro Beijing committee. Right. That's point one. The other point is, obviously, the repercussions of what is happening in Hong Kong is greatly influencing the Chinese leadership uh, for obvious reasons, because they don't want the contagion to spread. spread. And therefore, as you see, you must have noticed in the mainland Chinese press, is heavily censored, although the... Uh, the Chinese, as we all know, are savvy enough to, to get over yes. uh, that kind of censorship. But the second reason, I think, which is very important, is th uh, that the uh, president of China, Xi Jinping, uh, is tightening his hold and has tightened his hold both on the military and the political structure. Right. And he's considered he, to be the strongest leader in the last several decades. Yes, well, he's been compared to Mao in Mao terms of the good, kind of power exactly. he has amassed. Exactly. And this, it, he considers as a challenge, in a way, to his leadership. Right. And of course, don't forget the very important uh, issue of Taiwan, 
which is a democracy right. as we know it, and uh, the kind of influence this is going to have on the people of Taiwan. As it is, you know, there was this famous uh, sit-in in the Taiwanese parliament by students because they felt that the uh, present leader, the uh, present president, was getting too close to the Chinese in terms of trade uh, issues in particular. So there's, there's a, this combination of factors which I think is responsible. And of course, this, uh, one must uh, admire the resilience of the students who have continued to uh, demonstrate for weeks together and uh, against, uh, you know, the, the, the police first intervened. And wisely, they have kept away for the moment. Right. But for how long is it, it's an open question. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chakravarti, you know, there, there has been... Uh, one. Some of the analysts feel that what is happening in Hong Kong, you know, they have, they, they are also, they have been influenced by what has happened across, in many countries across the world. You, have, you were in Thailand, you were an ambassador in Thailand. Thailand also witnessed something like this some time back, not, though not exactly like this. The government, the Shinawatra government being uh, deposed and things like that. You think the influence of what is happening in the neighborhood is also causing this, is also having an, its effect there? Well, one parallel one can see immediately is that, that the Occupy Central kind of an attitude, which was also in Thailand when the, when the red shirts occupied a major part of the, of the Thai capital, Bangkok, and brought the city almost to a standstill. And a similar thing is happening here. And uh, what Hong Kong, of course, has the, has the world's press. It's the financial capital. A lot of foreigners live there. So I think this is, uh, they, they know that by doing this, they are going to capture the, the media headlines and bring this whole story out into the open uh, in, under the glare of publicity. Now, Occupy Central also means that it's like a parallel in Egypt, for example, right. where, where they had the Tahrir Square, you know, they sat there and... So there seems to be a, a certain trend uh, among the young people particularly that this is the way. And one more thing I must, I must highlight and underline here is that it is quite non-violent. The civil disobedience is non-violent. <coughs> I think um, we can see that it is Gandhiji's, you know, you, know, you know, somehow, somewhere there is a shadow of Gandhiji on these movements. And that is how uh, I see it. And I think uh, it is largely going to remain non-violent because that is, uh, that is how they have, I think, going to have conceived it and that is, that is how they will go forward. And that is why the, the opposing forces or the Chinese government and others, the police, are so reluctant, I think, so far to use force. To use force. Right. Right. Mr. Goshal, it's, that's very interesting, you know, peaceful movements happening, influence of what has happened in Egypt, Thailand, all, all other places. And another thing which you pointed out about the economic, uh, you know, reasons Equality. because of which it is. You, so you think that there is some kind of a class conflict going on there? Definitely, to my mind, that, you know, there is a kind of a polarization between the rich and not so rich people. In fact, some of the warnings given by the corporate houses right. that if such kind of protests continue, it will ruin Hong Kong. Right. These are indications of a threat that they perceive in terms of their societal kind of a position that they occupy at this moment. I think I also look at it from another angle that as Professor Kashiram Sharma had mentioned that the vulnerability of the Chinese sort of system and the leadership and all that, I think it's interconnected between the foreign policy and the domestic politics. You see in the foreign policy front, China is now trying to be very assertive. It feels that its time has come to assert itself and establish its own supremacy, particularly in Asia. Now, on the one hand, you see that it has already somehow uh, antagonized some of its neighbors, like Philippines, Vietnam, and almost in the process of creating some kind of a polarization in Asia. On the other hand, you see challenges emanating from within. Right. You know, not only in Hong Kong, but also in Tibet, as well as in the case of Xinjiang. Xinjiang. So it's a kind of a challenge, maybe to the authority of Xi, uh, Xi Jinping, because he is trying to uh, consolidate his authority 
and trying to portray himself as the most powerful leader in China and trying to achieve what has been lost in the history. So I think this seems to be a major challenge. And I think the movement in Hong Kong will also to a large extent determine how China is going to behave in terms of its future, both in its domestic arena as well as in its foreign policy. Foreign policy and how it will deal with other countries. Uh, Professor Shama, you know, the foreign hand theory, you know, this was, this has been talked about for some time now that, you know, when is it that the, there are already now, uh, we have started reading reports that Chinese leadership thinks the U.S. is behind all this, what is happening there. You think that the U.S. will have interest to create this kind of a problem there? And how is it going to benefit if it is actually involved in this? Well, <coughs> personally, I will not give much credence to such opinion. It's an internal problem. You know, I, I would like to make one comment on this. This moment for democracy in Hong Kong has serious implications. In my opinion, one of the most serious implications is, you know, China has accumulated a huge hard power. China is maintaining the largest army. Another fact which is not appreciated in this country, China is spending more on internal security rather than spending on the defense. Right. Now, on one hand, China has acquired huge hard power, I repeat, atomic weapons, missiles, army, etc., etc. Now China also realizing that no, no state can rule through hard power. China cannot become a superpower simply on the basis of hard power. China needs some soft power. I again repeat, a, 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 a country cannot become great unless a country acquires soft power. Therefore, there is a possibility that China may reach with some kind of a negotiated settlement little bit here, little bit there, respecting the, the, the movements of the Hong Kong people, you know. I mean, for the time being, Chinese are sounding very, 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 very dogmatic on this issue. Right. Very but rigid. Of, that we will not negotiate. You know, we will have to, uh, have to have a say in choosing the chief executive. I have a feeling, wait for a couple of days, if the movement is intensified. Because within China also, the other day I was reading the local press and in several provinces in China, there has been a local protest in support of the students in Hong Kong. So the, the Chinese leadership has come under, is coming under some kind of a pressure internally also? Absolutely, there is Mr. a pressure. Nial Singh? And what is this foreign hand theory of uh, the Chinese? You, you think... No, that is, you trot, trot it out uh, every, every time, time there, there is such a movement or incident. So I don't take that too seriously. And I wonder if they themselves, the, the take leadership it. takes it seriously. Because this, this is the, the usual formula. No, it is a serious crisis for the Chinese leadership. I do not see them making any substantive confession on this, as far as I can gather. Because uh, the present president has a very hard line in terms of... China's uh, dream. There is something which he has, you know, touted about China's dream. This is, this is something which goes against the grain of that uh, policy or, you know... Well, yes, it's, has... it's against his very conviction. Because he is for a very hard state. And in terms of exercising power, that hard state is going to the limits. And uh, I, I think in his dictionary, apart from cosmetic changes, there is no... So, so, so are, you, are you trying to say that this, this um, the kind of restraint which we are witnessing by the security forces and all, can, you know, it may not be so restrained in, in, in the coming Well, day. it's quite possible. Because in the end... And they would loath to do it because of the repercussions. I mean, you know, the uh, People's Army, uh, People's Army uh, contingent is there, very next to where the demonstrations are taking place, and they've been placed on alert. Right. But they'd loath to do it in terms of its uh, international political repercussions, apart from repercussions in Hong Kong and China. But I think that uh, there is very little room for real concession making as far as the present Chinese leadership is concerned. Mr. Chakravarti, would you agree with that? There is little room for concessions because what is the concession which the protesters are demanding? They are saying that there are, 
there has to be free elections free i mean everybody should be free to contest these elections there can't be any pre screening you think that any concession given by the chinese now can as mr nyal singh says that you know can hurt the image of the leader itself you know i see well in the sense that i i agree that uh, they will probably find a solution because the the uh, the extreme options are quite negative and uh, for uh, for china it will also for china play a role in terms of what signal it sends to taiwan and as to how they deal with this situation the hardliners in taiwan will certainly if if they if there is a bloody crackdown on the hong kong protesters which probably we we hope we should not we will not see but if there is one then imagine the kind of signals it will go to taiwan uh, where the hardliners will say ki look if this is how china is going to deal with uh, dissent and democratic uh, upsurge then you know there is no way we will we will come, we can come to any arrangement uh, with china so china is again left uh, you know between a rock and a hard place as to how to deal with this and i think the chinese uh, <clears throat> chinese communist party and the chinese system this is one of its fundamental flaws although they do deal with dissent in many ways within china and there are a lot of small fires going off in all over the place of tibet is there of course that's a big thing xinjiang is there where of you know almost on a daily basis you have problems there but there the chinese government usually deals with it with a pretty heavy hand there and but the hong kong they cannot because uh, because of the fact that this one country two systems there was an arrangement an agreement and it today it seems that the chinese want to want to abandon that kind of promises that they made so there is a problem there and i think the chinese um, have a have a have a have have to deal with it in 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 a much more different way they also have the the old experience of tiananmen square right okay uh, mr chakravarty quickly how do, you know what should india do what is india expected to do in this kind of situation we we know uh, that you know there are lot of uh, Indi- uh, people of indian origin who live in hong kong so does india have to play a role in this what kind of a role you think that india should be playing i don't think india can play any particular role apart from saying that it should be handled peacefully i have already mentioned you know the non violent nature which which you know gandhi ji's legacy and things like that so i don't think india can really say ki any, do anything much apart from uh, apart from uh, saying ki please handle it you know peacefully and come to a solution but yes indians are there and if indian nationals come under some threat then of course india will have to have to be concerned and make sure that we look after their interests like we do in other countries whenever there is a problem so for gosha indian uh, you think the indian government can play any any role you, or you agree with mr uh, chakravarty that you know just stay off it and i don't think the number of indians in hong kong are that large as to play any crucial role in terms of this protest movement and you don't hear much of any indians joining this kind of protest movement and most of them are traders or professionals and they would not like to sort of you know get involved in active politics so as a result i don't think that india has any role in this kind of a situation and i think it's better for india to just watch the developments and you and as far as as far as the chinese leadership's uh, you know options are concerned i yeah. think this is one of the biggest challenge i think the leadership is facing today because if they try to be hard and try to suppress the movement i think this will have very serious implications as i said that not only in terms of its domestic constituents but also in terms of its foreign policy right. options in terms of you know mobilizing greater opposition to china but at the same time it if it reconciles with this kind of a movement you know it will also have an effect on tibet right xinjiang and other places so i think it's a real dilemma for the chinese so leadership much. and i think they will have to find out a way middle way to come out with some kind of a compromise so that it neither gets you know undermined the leadership gets undermined nor it tries to undermine the democracy protest movement in Hong which is Kong. not a which is not a very easy thing to it's not uh, easy thing but i think they will have to and chinese are sometimes good at finding 
some kind of a way out out you, of the you think so situation. professor sharma uh, may I make a comment <clears throat> so we are running out of time quickly yes i want to know. on one hand china has its strength expanding economy 8 trillion gdp muscular nationalism on the other hand china has its fault lines i have a feeling you know there are three ways to understand china and hong kong i repeat i would like my fellow panelists also to make a comment one way is i read the text chinese government has stated its position leaders have stated their position leaders of the democracy this is one way of understanding there is another way of understanding you know i read in between the lines and i for one i will read in between the lines in between the lines are very interesting okay uh, sunil singh finally you think that uh, you know as professor goshal says that chinese have a way of finding solutions to these kind of tricky issues they should be able to find some solution well i think they are trying to find the issue but i find it will be a very difficult undertaking for the present leadership given their world view and their own philosophies okay i think on that note uh, we will have to hand it is a it is something which will have to be uh, will have to keep a close watch on as every panelist here feels that you know it's a it's the toughest challenge which the chinese leadership has faced since a very long time so we'll have to wait and watch how it will deal with this situation and how the people of hong kong who are out there in the streets will react to what the chinese government will do thanks to all my guests uh, pinak ranjan chakravarti professor baladas goshal professor sharma and uh, mr nihal singh please keep watching we'll come back with another issue in big pictures same time tomorrow